Hello friends, good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all our viewers who have joined from different parts of the world. And some of them, in fact, one of our speakers has joined from and rode from one city to another. So welcome to this session of APCR SHR 10 virtual, the ongoing virtual series of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights. This virtual conference comprising 14 thematic sessions is being co-hosted by APCR SHR 10, Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia and CNS. These sessions are also streamed live on the Facebook pages of APCR SHR 10 and CNS. Today's session is the 11th in the series and it is on the theme of persons with disabilities and their SRHR needs in the context of Asia and the Pacific. And it is in the lead up to the 2020 International Day of Persons with Disabilities that as we all know is observed every year on the 3rd of December. I'm happy to share with you that we have two sign language interpreters to guide today's session for the benefit of our audience. Uh, just a few quick housekeeping announcements for our viewers before I hand over the mic to our chairperson for today. My humble request to all the presenters to please adhere to your allotted time schedule. There will be a prompt from the chairperson two minutes before your allotted time ends. Uh, audience, please keep yourself muted and your videos turned off throughout the session. And presenters are also requested to mute themselves while not speaking. There will be a question and answer session after all the speakers have presented. Those who are using Zoom platform can type in their comments and questions in the chat box, and you can do so even as speakers present and not wait till the end. If you are watching it on Facebook Live, you can type in your questions in the comment box. In the interest of time, please keep your questions and comments brief and precise, and we will try to take up as many questions as possible. Uh, also, we are living in challenging times. Most of us are working from home, so please bear with each other and with me in case of any technical glitches arising of out of poor internet connectivity, if they arise at all. I now hand over the mic to our chairperson for today, Abhya Akram. Abhya wears many crowns. She is the chairperson of Asia Pacific Women with Disabilities Network. She is also the CEO of National Forum of Women with Disabilities and is on the board of Asia Pacific Women Law and Development, that is APWLD. With a personal experience of physical disability, Abhya has been engaged in the activities of disability movement since 1997. And she has been leading the disability youth and women's movement in Pakistan, as well as in the Asia Pacific region. She highlights the concerns on women with disabilities in the global agenda through her engagement in disability focused grassroots activism and broader policy making. She lobbies with parliamentarians and high level representatives in the struggle of giving voice to women with disabilities. Also, we have, as I said before, we have uh, two sign language interpreters today. Now over to you, Abhya. Thank you so much, Abha. Thank you so much for your time today. And I'm really very warm welcome to all the participants, all the listeners, our distinguished panelists and the speakers. And thank you so much for joining the today's conference of the Asia Pacific Conference of Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I believe like this was the critical time to organize the conference virtually because we all know about the COVID uh, pandemic situation. We were supposed to meet virtually, physically in Cambodia, but unfortunately it didn't happen. But I'm mature like to this conference, we will um, uh, uh, listen and uh, learn from the experiences of all the experts who are joining today. So thank you so much for organizing 
in this. We know 10 to 15 percent of the total population are persons with disability, and 50 percent of them are women and girls with disability. And again, like 80 percent of them are living in the rural areas, and they all are facing the same challenges and the problems of the sexual health and reproductive rights, which was never been discussed or bringing to the point where we can address a practical strategy. We uh, know that persons with disabilities who are confined in the homes, and especially during the COVID pandemic, this situation is getting worse. And they have like um, the infrastructural barriers, the communication barriers, and the most importantly, the legislative barriers, which are not allowing them to come these uh, dialogues and practical steps on the mainstream organizations agenda or on the policy level. So this is a really important to talk about it from the perspective of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And since we are talking about the Asia Pacific region, so we have the Incheon strategy. Under that, which is clearly mentioned about the sexual health and reproductive rights. So how we can link it from the grassroots level to the national and national to the global level. We know the sustainable development goals are there who have the clear like political mandate and people are working on it. So how we can reference that and bring some practical strategies in our discussions on the country level with uh, encouraging the state to talk about the sexual health and reproductive rights of persons with disability. And at the same time, when we talk about the disabled people organizations roles and their engagement. So I'm really thankful for the conference today because we will get the opportunity to learn from the experiences and many of the recommendations will coming up in the discussion. I'm really thankful for our uh, two sign language interpreters who are going to facilitate us today. It's Lucy Lim and Go Su Lin. Thank you so much. I think this is really important to have all the communication in different ways. So if you have any concerns or problems, just raise your hand and we will stop there to uh, talk in detail. I know uh, some of us have the disability to talk very fast, but you can always say us like to stop and we can uh, share our thoughts. Thank you so much. Uh, without any further ado, I think I'll move to our esteemed panelists who are present today. Um, first of all, I would request Sanjila Khan from Pakistan. She have uh, like you have 15 minutes, Sanjila, to talk um, uh, about your role how you bring the concerns of persons with disabilities in the she is the founder of the girly thing pakistan which delivers sanitary napkins other products and also an urgent menstrual kits to women and girls with disability anywhere across pakistan catering to women in small and metro cities and villages she is a woman rights advocate and also the motivational speaker and writer who has published two novels. And she has um, sold her books to fund community projects in the field of disability, women empowerment, education, and environment. She is passionate about working with people with disabilities on sexual health and reproductive rights and prevention and un unsafe abortion. Uh, Sanjira, you have 15 minutes to present your space. Thank you so much, please. Thank you so much, Apia, and assalamu everyone. It gives me immense pleasure that um, along with all of you over here in this conversation about such an important subject, I also have two people who have been part of my journey, Abhya Akram herself being one. Um, she is like a mentor to me, a friend and a sister, and she has always stood up for the importance of SRHL in our country. This I can vouch for because we both are colleagues also and we come from Pakistan. And the other one is Dakshita. And as I go on, I'll share that my journey actually started um, with a platform where Dakshita was a part of and look Daki how far we've come, which is great and still a long way to go. I think my presentation will be in a couple of steps. I would start with my personal journey, then go all the way to the situation of my country. 
in terms of SRHR, I think we all would be able to relate to because we may have borders, but pretty much we have the same problems, which is a good and a bad thing. And then we'll talk about global uh, circumstances and how things have changed in times of the pandemic. I would also like to highlight about two major projects that I have been working on and a way forward for all of us about what we can do with and and for people with disabilities um, for SRHR. So to begin with, um, I come from an agricultural army background and I was born with a deformity. And my identity is important because my placement has been in a place where I think I was really privileged. I got access to education. I could speak in two to three language. So I had a better access towards understanding the issue, yet it took me a long time to realize that SRHR remains the core of identity. It's important to know what are your sexual reproductive and health rights to understand yourself better and hence set a pathway for yourself in life. And with disability, some of the major challenges that I can tell you as a person is that we struggle with identity a lot. We don't see ourselves as a fit in the society. All the buildings are made for the able-bodied. For example, we go to any ice cream parlor and there are steps over there. So we wonder, hmm, that's not really for us. The same applies to policies and legislator, uh, legislatives and structures of how the society runs. So we are always isolated. And I think the disability does not take a toll on the person. The psychological effects of that takes bigger toll on the person. And hence, we start isolating ourselves slowly from the society. So even if there are platforms, we take a, a, a long time to actually come on board. So a lot of work needs to be done in different areas, especially when it comes to SRHR. So personally, what happened with me was that I was occupied in understanding issues around me and what is my power. I realized that my power is my public speaking. And though, of course, the family system is really orthodox, the structure around me is not very supportive towards women, but I knew that there was space for development and as a person, I could always apply my advocacy skills around me. And now my entire family is on board. My extended family is on board. So my first leadership project was my own family and my, my society around me. And so far, I think it takes time, but change do happen if you keep at it. To talk about SRHR for any normal person is a challenge, yet alone a person with disability. But nothing is a challenge if you find the right language you make enough mistakes to understand what will work. And once you find that, that becomes a fruit for the entire, entire generation, the entire world. So I think I've been really busy making mistakes and doing experiments. I knew SRHR is a challenge even for any average organization out there working in Pakistan. So for me to come up front and highlight these issues on government level, policy level, there had to be other ways. So now coming to national uh, level, there are a lot of issues of communication and there is no mention of person with disabilities in any of our structures because I, th I think the policy makers are more busy focusing on other issues and everything takes a lot of time, but it's for you and I to ensure that the subject comes up front on and on and some somewhere it would be included. So what we did, me as a person and my team, we came up with two particular uh, school of thoughts. And so far that has worked, but, but the progress is a bit slow because we understand that it takes time. Firstly, we realized that we need to be more creative around the focus that we have to talk about a taboo subject in any community. Disability in itself is so taboo and you match it with SRHR, it becomes like, you know, a double scoop ice cream that has to be digested. And it's a bit hard for some people who are daily intolerant. So and I think that goes for our policymakers and many leaders today. So we camouflage the entire concept through creativity and we use mediums such as video and particularly 
theater because theater was a live experience that anybody could have and instantly connect with that situation instantly feel how much you connect how much you understand the problem and say that hmm this is something that even applies to me so our theater technique was not just a play that you're watching it was more about being part of the play where we would make participants become the actors we would make them address their own biases and i really enjoyed this particular technique myself because as a person with disability i'm confined to the wheelchair but through theater i could be a fairy i could be a butterfly i could be anybody i could be a victim i could also be somebody who lends help and being in both these situations gave me a better perspective of where i stand i think our projects included um, the ones that included theater of taboo and a couple of other workshops with women with disabilities gave us even more insight into what goes beyond srhr and that is a missing gap there there's a huge gap where when we don't provide services and products to people with disabilities we actually miss out on a huge market so now i'm talking about a bit about the entrepreneurial side or sustainability of a particular project many of the organizations they have their programs but they're basically they're mostly on 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 the charity model and since ages since i've been in the, on this planet it's been 30 years i've been no, i've been noticing that we only treat people with disabilities when it comes to charity i think all the funding that is routed it's more coming from a charity uh, mindset rather than an investment mindset i think that's a huge challenge even in terms of srhr because once you invest in any community in terms of srhr that community thrives that community gains confidence that community wants to come forward and become a contributing member of the society so it's actually uh, an economic benefit to the entire nation and then it would trickle down further uh, globally uh, because we are investing in a very core issue of any community now people with disabilities if we if we see the journey a young person he or she hits puberty they need access to information they need products they need services i think we all are clear about the entire comprehensive plan that we need as an individual for our srhr a person with disabilities plan is no different the only added barrier is the barrier towards access of information towards products and services and attitudinal barriers that they're facing anyways because of their disability so what we do is that okay i thought somebody was about to say something okay so what we do is that we have these workshops through creative alley we call them theater of taboo and we try to bring all these these communities together we don't particularly work for people with disabilities because the strategy cannot be for you it has to be with you you don't have to work for people with disabilities that doesn't work because they're not alienated they're, they're part of the society they're all over the place they they require that kind of inclusion that makes them feel that they are part of the solution and not just part of the problem so what we do is that we invite people from different walks of life and we give them different tasks we make them question their own values and we put them together and then we also give them a direction on what they will do next time they come across a situation whether they're doctors lawyers media personalities bloggers or could be anybody but to make sure they're sensitized enough about people with disabilities and their srhr i think that is like a toolkit that we give to them for their leadership and so far uh, in qualitative terms on a national level i think the conversation has been ignited all over the place particularly the space of entrepreneurship because it's a thriving community and we have really important influential people in that area because everybody loves money they want to make money so we need to push our school of thought in spaces where the power lies so once they go once they go back to solutions once they go back to making their own projects they should understand there is a community here that not not need they don't need help it's a market it has to be regarded and respected as a market and it has to be treated as a market and products and services specifically need to be designed for them and this uh, brings me to my 
uh, latest project which is called girly things and what girly things does is that we focus on young women we had to specify things over here so i think young women become being the youngest uh, youngest beneficiaries of the community that need to be empowered because if you empower one woman you empower probably her entire colony no the entire nation so we focused on empowering women and giving them menstrual healthcare information also providing them with access to products and services that are regularly available in the market also and also environmental environmentally uh, friendly we may have sanitary napkins here in the market but there are so many other products that can be used and they're not in the market so you know we become that bridge and our usp is that because of the taboo nature many times females hesitate to go to the market to get their own products and that starts this negativity about their own body and how they see themselves we had to crush that so we said your autonomy over your body is yours you get to order your products and only you know what you want and we provide it to you so this was the strategy and so far it's working but simultaneously we also work on advocacy we also ignite conversations on forums where SRHR has nothing to do, but we're proud to do that because SRHR has to do with everything. And I would also like to, uh, I don't know how much time I have, but I would also like to conclude with two school of thoughts. One is uh, another project that we started, it was comedy and disability. And since of course we had to camouflage the entire area with a lot of other subjects, which is fine because we'll get there. we came up with a short film which was a comedy short film on disability and that happens to be the very first such content to be produced here in pakistan and the entire subject of that film is about this girl who is not seen as a sexual being a girl who has a disability people expect her to motivate them to become these you know globes in the society that's it and that's their job but disregard the fact that she has bills to pay or she might want to get married or have children or want to know anything or be part of the regular course of life so this is an experience that many of us as people with disabilities face we're expected to become motivational speakers we're expected to become inspirational we're not allowed to frown or cry if we cry about probably you know pizza delivery being late we we taught we taught that okay you know you you're supposed to be thankful okay are you crying because of your disability i'm like no we have other problems so i think this mindset also had to be changed so this short film we created and we also ignited a discussion around it that why is it how it is and now we're coming up with more such media also uh if my chair allows i can also uh, share the link over here and in conclusion i would like to add a bit about the current pandemic situation here in pakistan and i i'm sure pretty much elsewhere also because we we all have gone digital we all have suddenly uh, become one which i've been saying for the past 30 years we are one and finally we know that now i think the entire battle uh, for a person with disability the entire fight was about access about being part of the public space and all of a sudden the public spaces are not safe enough so we were pulling people with disabilities out of their shells and out of their cocoons so the household for some it seems like a safe space a space where uh, they're okay they're comfortable that's not the case for many others out there it's not like that i think sometimes a person with disability is more empowered when he or she leaves the house and they have better access to information without dependency they have better access to services with their privacy without any member of the household involved and because i also run a hotline through girly things there are a lot of queries that come where women feel unsafe people so much effort into building a a sense of self esteem with themselves and the uncertainty is killing them the uncertainty is giving them this mindset that okay that's it i'm i'm going back to square one so we really need to pull them out and say okay hold it we have online opportunities we have digital opportunities build your skills build your emotional muscle we're going to get through this together we're fine and at the same time i feel the entire world has been disabled so um disability is not a concept that is limited to one particular body type it is a mindset it is an attitude and many times even structures that are in place to help you have a very disabling attitude 
so i think we need to focus on that sometimes some attitudes can even disable an entire nation or entire community that had a perfectly able body with no impairments so i think uh, the concept of disability and srhr connects well with the general narrative and as a way forward firstly i would like to invite all civil society organizations to reconsider the programs that they have designed do not treat people with disabilities as a beneficiary just we all are beneficiaries of course but not just that but as a community that is being missed out upon they have so much to contribute they have a knowledge they have a mindset because of my disability i was able to identify the disabling attitudes of the society so it's like you know personal thesis that i'm constantly doing i enter a restaurant i'm always applying that lens and then i'm giving feedback to the owner that you know what if you put in a ramp here you're going to get more business because if i come there will be 10 other people coming with me so what does that mean for you and it's like hmm not a bad idea so you know that's how a particular startup is growing we need to apply these strategies to our existing programs we don't have to reinvent the wheel and on a personal level i think we all need to adopt the lens of inclusivity and make sure that we don't have a disabling attitude towards anybody regardless of the impairment of their body or uh, their background or any other identity that they have and i think uh, with this i would like to conclude i'm not sure how much time i took but i'm available for any questions and i look forward to hear my um, my speakers also okay we uh, have a second so, plenary speaker as seta reki makanawai and mr seta reki is currently the ceo of pacific disability forum and he was previously the executive director fiji national council for disabled persons uh and he head teacher fiji school for the blind he graduated from corpus christi teachers college in fiji in 1985 <laughs> and uh, he is a leading disability advocate in asia and the pacific region he has served in the committees of many international and regional organizations concerned with disability and uh, today Mr. Setariki will be talking on transforming access to sexual and reproductive health and gender-based violence services for women and young people with disabilities in the Pacific. Over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam. And um, may I may may I start uh, first by acknowledging the organizers for uh, uh, inviting um, uh, a representative from the Pacific. And indeed, I say. uh to you all a very warm pacific greetings from the pacific uh, also apology in advance uh, from my end i'm actually on the road i've uh, detoured to a hotel nearby to uh, uh take part in this webinar and i do uh, apologize in advance if there's some background noise that you might hear as i speak um that is a um, i'll go now to my presentation and thanks uh, to bobby for the um uh, helping with the slides uh that indeed the uh, the topic of my sharing this afternoon is around for me transforming access to sexual and reproductive health and, uh, and and gender based violence services to for women and people with disabilities in our region here in the pacific um next slide please uh bobby um uh, uh, just this next couple of slides i think this is um Uh, important that i just share a few uh, information about the uh, organization i work for the pacific disability forum uh, this is our vision an inclusive and equitable pacific society where all human rights of all persons with disabilities are real, realized as outlined in the united nations convention on the rights of persons with disabilities next slide please uh this is our mission statement to ensure full inclusive and effective participation of persons with disabilities in pacific island island towns and territories through our evidence based advocacy and active engagement in policy development implementation and monitoring of the shared pd stg and other relevant global and regional uh instruments and frameworks 
in, of course, in collaboration with relevant stakeholders. Ne next slide, please. Uh, just uh, this last slide on our organization, Pacific Disability Forum. Uh, these are areas of work uh, that we strive to be inclusive, responsible, sustainable organization, Pacific Disability Forum. Um, a slide area, uh, here, here's area two. Evidence, data, and information for inclusive policies. Uh, crystal area three, ensuring the preconditions for inclusion, carry for promoting leadership and deepening partnership for inclusion and crystal area five, regional cooperation and resource mobilization. Now to the essence of our workshop, uh, of our webinar this afternoon. Next slide, please. Uh, you'll, you, you'll note in my uh, presentations, I've referred to uh, research, I referred to policy engagement, and I suppose that's where I'm coming from as a, a regional mm -hmm. disabled persons organization in the Pacific, working mm -hmm. with uh, about 71 um, uh, member organizations in 21, 22 Pacific Island countries and territories. So this... Uh, We we are working on the on uh, this this research that you are working on is in partnership with uh, uh, Women's Enable International. That's that's the the W that's way, um, and this research. Uh, research is to provide expertise on disability related issues in the Pacific region on this project under this project goal. To understand what is the legal, social, and uh, policy communication barriers that prevent women and young people with disabilities from accessing sexual and reproductive. Uh, health and uh, gender-based violence services on an equal basis with others. Uh, this project is funded by a UN FPA, United Nations Population Fund, uh, with the funding provided by the through the funding provided by the Government of Australia, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, which also funds the Pacific Disability, uh, Disability Forum. And this work is part of a, a larger project to improve, to improve sexual and reproductive health uh, rights in our region. Uh, next slide, please. The research project. So this study is conducted in three countries and three priority countries, Fiji, Samoa, and Vanuatu. The research includes a field research, a focus group discussion, and individual inter in, uh, interviews with women with disabilities over 24 years, and of course with young uh, women and boys with disabilities uh, between the age of 15 and 20. And also it's in, in the, we are interviewing also other key, key stakeholders. May I also say at this point, this uh, research is actually happening at the moment. Uh, and there are also site visits involved in this research. Uh, uh, there's a desk research where the, the mapping of relevant laws and policies are conducted in the three countries. And then there is this research report that will be provided to NFPA analyzing findings and identifying key regional recommendations. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, for the purpose of this uh, research project, uh, uh, we, uh, the Women's Enable International and PDF, the project partners, are looking at the access to the following services. 
are for women and young people with disabilities. Firstly, contraceptive information, goods and services. Uh, maternal, secondly, maternal, maternal and newborn health services. Uh, family life education programs, information, testing and treatment for sexually transmitted infections and women's reproductive health services as well as health uh, health services for survivors of gender-based sexual violence including justice and policing services so these efforts uh, how, how, what are the efforts that we can um, can be done to address and, and prevent gender-based violence? Uh, next slide, please. Now, this uh, research that we are working on at the moment, uh, it will go into next year. The, it's built uh, on a previous research that was also done by UNFPA, United Nations Population Fund. Uh, it was done in 2013, but uh, the research was uh, called uh, Deeper Silence. Uh, so this research, is res the current research is building on the findings of that 20 uh, 2013 research uh, entitled Deeper Silence. Um, as I said, the report is produced by UNFPA. Uh, and the research comprised of situation analysis, exploring the sexual, and reproductive health needs of women with disabilities in three Pacific Island countries. These three countries are different uh, from the ones that we are doing the research in now. These countries are Kiribati, Solomon Islands, and Tonga. The, for this time, it's uh, Fiji, Samoa, and Vanuatu. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just to share with you, and I think this is where we are pointing towards uh, in the work that we are currently doing, some of the recommendations uh, um, emanating from the Deeper Silence uh, report. Uh, how we are, the, the need for PDF uh, to discuss new initiatives and ensure that all actions taken at national uh, levels are done in collaboration with the national DPOs. I think it's a critical point to make here. Also, my colleague earlier talked about uh, working um, uh, not for persons with disabilities. Our organization um, works slightly different. We work for and with persons with disabilities. As a regional disabled people's organization, we work with our partners. In this case, Women Able International, um, DFAT, Department for Affairs and Trade Government Australia, um, and also UNFPA. So work with our partners and at the regional level and the work done at the national level. And I think for, for matters concerning uh, related disability, we will need to involve, particularly at the national level, national DPOs. So our work is done in collaboration with the national DPOs um, at the, uh, the national level. Um, uh, and also the need to provide uh, in-service training for all staff on sexual and reproductive health and rights issues for women with disabilities. And these are some of the things that, are that we've already been happening together with, uh, with the members um, uh, that we also partner with, like uh, IPPF, the members on the Grand Family Health Associations across the region. We provide the disability inclusion training in their programs through our members in country. We have uh, two minutes for you. Sure, okay, right. Um, uh, the understanding of gender disability issues, including sexuality. Sorry. Uh, and the need to support I, personal disabilities. Sorry. Can I, can I interrupt, Sitariki? I think you have enough time. So you can continue for uh, another five minutes. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. Thank I'm you. almost done. I think the other thing also is... Uh, how do we provide uh, support to the survivors uh, of, uh, of violence against women and girls with disabilities? Um, how we relate with women uh, NGOs? Um, we, uh, and I think uh, in me coming in to be part of this panel, 
Uh, we do have women with disabilities uh, who are also my colleagues in the Disability Forum and also members from our organization. But I think it's critical that we, that this issue not just be a women's issue. Uh, we need to take this challenge on board for us as the Disability Forum along with our partners as an organizational issue. Uh, and there's nothing stopping men, including men with disabilities like myself, to be involved. Uh, in, in writing the, this wrong. Uh, and and uh, talking about um, uh, supporting the, uh, the awareness research programs in the communities for the survivors. Um, and, and I think it's, it's very interesting to note that uh, as a result of that research, several women with disabilities uh, have come up with this idea to uh, to, to look at how we can support a pilot a training in the community. Uh, last slide, I think this is my last, uh, second last slide. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and these are some also the key considerations. Again, I said efforts are guided by local uh, and national debate. Nothing about us without us. I made this point earlier of needing to consult uh, personal disabilities in our project that we're currently doing. We're targeting women with disabilities um, 24 and above, uh, and for young, uh, young women and girls and boys with disabilities between the age of 15 and 24. The idea of nothing uh, about us without us. Um, the twin track approach, I think that's also something that we are doing, uh, emanating out of this report in 2013, uh, whilst there's a need for disability specific uh, work we we'll need to work with our partners as in the current case of our project with Women Able International uh, to, to um, address this issue of, um, of transforming access uh, to uh, women with disabilities. Um, and I think uh, for us in PDF, uh, once we have work done at the national level, I think as a regional organization, how can we walk across uh, um, other uh, our alliances, uh, regional NGOs to also address the regional uh, response. And I'm glad uh, that, that this is much uh, alive here in the Pacific. We acknowledge the work of uh, Piango, of DIVA, um, of our the women organizations uh, across the organization, uh, across the country, the region. And uh, forgive me for not identifying you and acknowledge the work that you are doing. So it's a great partnership. And uh, we, uh, we have specific disability forum uh, engaged in this uh, process. So I'll, I'll conclude here by, by, by thanking again the organizers for the opportunity uh, uh, to uh, 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 persons with disabilities in the, in the region, particularly uh, addressing the needs of sexual and uh, reproductive health rights of women with disabilities and then in this particular um, research, the access to services, how we can transform, transform these services so that they are, are not just tokenistically included, but genuinely uh, involved in the process. So again, a big and thank you from uh, Fiji for the opportunity to, to share my presentation. Uh, for those of you who uh, would like to have a copy, it's with the organizers, Bobby, uh, please uh, do share with uh, those that are requesting. Otherwise, flick me an email, uh, at disability.org and we'll graciously share of my presentation. And please look forward to the findings of this research. And I do thank Women Enable International uh, for supporting us in this project with the funding from the government of Australia through DFET. Thank you and God bless. Thank you so much, Dr. Akis. It's really great to hear the examples you have shared of your work on the field level and how the evidence-based research you have done for the young people with disabilities, women with disabilities on the gender-based avoidance. And I think this is the need where we can see some of the examples, we can technically link it with the implementation plans and how we are translating these good practices in easy to understand languages.
for young people with disabilities to know and then they can contribute, especially from the perspective of the disabled people organizations. Thank you so much for your intervention. Um, now we will move to the second uh, panel where we will talk about the presentations of the abstracts. And we have the first speaker, Ms. Uh, Ms. Rakshita Vikramanthan, sorry if I didn't pronounce it well, but uh, he will talk about uh, We Hear You, a sign language glossary on sexual and reproductive health and rights of people with hearing disability. So we are very fortunate to have the sign language interpretations also here. Thanks to the interpreters, and we are really looking forward to hear from you. Thank you. Please, Dakshita. Thank you so much, Abhya. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I, first of all, would like to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to speak at this event. Uh, I am Dakshita Vikramaratna. I am a Sri Lankan, currently based in Sri Lanka. and. Uh, I am the co-founder and the program director of the Youth Advocacy Network Sri Lanka. Uh, Youth Advocacy Network Sri Lanka, or YNSL, is a youth-led, women-led organization which is registered in Sri Lanka. Uh, we are operating independently and our focus has been, uh, since our registration, uh, to work on sexual and reproductive health and rights of all individuals of all age levels and all ethnicities in Sri Lanka. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, so my objective for the talk today is to uh, share some of the learnings and the process related uh, information around uh, the project we hear you of Yarn SL. Uh, and this project was largely centered around uh, the designing and publishing of a sign language glossary on sexual and reproductive health and rights. But before I uh, move on to uh, my presentation, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizations once again for uh, organizing sign language interpretations for this session. So if you, if there are any friends or colleagues who like to see the sign language interpretation, just uh, look at the videos of Lucy Lim or Song Le Go. And, uh, and, and thank you so much once again for organizing that to be more inclusive as possible uh, for this session. Uh, and um, I also need to say that uh, I am sharing this information as someone who was part of a program or in terms of designing a sign language glossary and working with people with hearing disabilities. So what I'm sharing shouldn't reflect as lived experiences of people living with hearing disabilities. I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a person who has been part of a project and I'm sharing based on the experiences and the observations I have made. Um, and moving before moving on, I'd also like to say that I have a lot of people to thank uh, for. Uh, I need to thank uh, the team of the Youth Advocacy Network Sri Lanka, Zera Priskila Lakmini, who are leading the organization. I should also thank Dulita Jayasekara, who was the um, who led the project from the beginning, who co-designed the project with me, and also Shailani Paliyavadan, who's leading the project right now. I must also thank um, our colleagues, at the former colleagues at the UNFPA Sri Lanka, who supported the project, Alain Sibanala, Garmini Vanasekara, and Nishanta Varnasurya. I must also thank uh, the colleagues at the British Council who are currently supporting us, Gil, uh, Gil Garot and Mani Sarwan Patirana. Uh, I should also uh, acknowledge uh, the colleagues at the Sri Lanka Central Federation for the day. Without them, we, will never, we would have never been able to come up with a sign language glossary. And also the, the principal administration, teachers and students at the Sri Lanka uh, School for the Deaf in Rasmalana. Um, so I will just basically um, uh, explain what this project is about. Uh, we, uh, we decided uh, to uh, work on people with hearing disabilities because we, uh, through uh, the interventions we have made in the past, we realized that there's a greater need for them to have better access to information and better access to uh, services on sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, so if we, uh, I will explain how we came up with the project. I will explain how uh, we designed the, mod, uh, the sign language glossary and then how we use the glossary in terms of designing further interventions to ensure that there's uh, quality access uh, to life-saving information on sexual and reproductive health and rights. Uh, if you move to the next slide, please. Um,
Right, thank you. Um, I uh, just wanted to share the video because uh, I wanted to introduce the VHU project. And uh, one of the reasons uh, we, uh, you know, uh, if you can actually move to the next slide, please, the objective slide, then we can discuss about uh, the reasons behind coming up with the VHU project of, uh, you know, Youth Advocacy Network Sri Lanka. We realized that there's a big uh, communication gap between people with hearing disabilities. Uh, uh, and this doesn't necessarily mean uh, about sexual and reproductive health and rights. In general, there's a communication gap because people with hearing disabilities have to rely on uh, a medium to communicate and express themselves. And that medium in most of the cases is sign language. And people who are providing services or providing information, uh, you know, people at police uh, officers, uh, hospitals, uh, courts, it's very difficult uh, for people with hearing disabilities to express themselves without relying on a sign language interpreter. And then we realized that um, uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights in general is a very taboo topic, socially and culturally taboo topic in, across Asia Pacific. And this becomes further uh, difficult um, for people with hearing disabilities. And I think people with any form of disability to access that information, it becomes further difficult, it becomes more taboo. Um, and uh, so we decide, we, we realize that um, uh, uh, people with hearing disabilities rely on sign language to express themselves and communicate themselves, but there are problems in terms of the signs of uh, the sign language uh, so that they are very limited uh, to express themselves uh, and specifically talk about their issues, their feelings and their expressions because the sign language is not broad enough to cover a wide range of uh, topics around sexual and reproductive health and rights. So that was our first objective to develop a sign uh, to uh, help people with hearing disability and service providers so that we can bridge that communication gap. The point number two uh, was to actually build on the glossary and see how we can use the sign language glossary to further strengthen the service provision and information provision on sexual and reproductive health and rights so that the people living with hearing disabilities would get more uh, life-saving information and services on SROHR. So uh, if we uh, move on to the next slide, please. Um, uh, through a national uh, consultation we did, uh, we, uh, we, you know, we got to know that uh, there are a wide range of issues faced by uh, people with hearing disabilities. Uh, there's, as I said before, there's a lack of signs, uh, there's a lack of uh, access to services and information, uh, and as Tansila initially mentioned, uh, generally people with disabilities are perceived as non-sexual beings, so it's very, uh, there's a lot of stigma and discrimination when they're accessing services, uh, stigma and discrimination even comes within their families and within their friends. Uh, that uh, that limits them from you know expressing themselves or uh, accessing information uh, you know which are very relevant for their health and their well-being. Um, there are a, a broad social and cultural taboos around sex, ex, sexual and reproductive health and rights, and that further uh, affects people with disabilities and specifically in our case, people with hearing disabilities who access that information. Uh, and from a larger policy level uh, point of view. In Sri Lanka, the sign language is also not recognized as an official language. Um, and it's not been uh, mentioned in the, the, the constitution of Sri Lanka uh, and, and uh, the only languages uh, recognized in Sri Lanka as official languages is Sinhalese and Tamil. And that, that also creates a lot of issues in terms of uh, you know, uh, legally uh, getting services to people with hearing disabilities in terms of their fundamental rights. Um, so uh, the, the methodology uh, based on these issues we identified through the national consultation we did with uh, the Sri Lanka Central Federation for the Deaf and also uh, students and teachers at the Sri Lanka School for the Deaf, we realized that uh, we need to come up with uh, a, a, a wide variety of solutions to address these gaps. And, and another issue when we are communicating with them uh, we felt was that uh, th there are issues with uh, there are challenges faced by the sign language interpreters as well, because sign language interpreters also rely on sign language to interpret, and then they also communicated that specifically sometimes um, they have to accompany people with hearing disabilities to go to uh, police stations or hospitals to help them in terms of getting services, uh, and and they they have these challenges to 
communicate properly to the uh, you know the, to the doctor or the person at the clinic or someone at the police station because the sign language is not broad enough to express themselves fully and specifically uh, as an asset um, so we realized that we there's a greater need to develop new signs uh, uh, particularly on sexual and reproductive health and rights so we proposed uh, we came up with a proposal and we had a discussion with back then the ministry of social services and what we did was we came up with uh, a multi stakeholder panel which included young people which included experts on education which included experts on sign language uh, which had the people with hearing disabilities themselves uh, also uh, you know activists and advocates on the field of srhr and and this group uh, actually discussed and debated for a, almost a period of 10 to 12 months and came up with a set of new signs which can be used uh, to communicate in sign language particularly on sexual and reproductive health and rights so the glossary was published in 2015 and uh, this glossary contains 234 signs uh, which uh, was actually acknowledged and uh, presented by the honorable minister back then minister s bd sanayak uh, on the international day of the disabled people uh, in december Uh, and while uh, uh, while we developed the sign language glossary at the same time we were uh, training uh, we are working closely with uh, the sign language interpreters in sri lanka and we used the glossary to develop a special training program for sign language interpreters so that they will be more sensitized and they will become more familiar around the new signs and and also they will be more um, uh, familiarized with the particular sexual and reproductive health issues faced by people with hearing disabilities Uh, if you move on to the next slide please uh so i will just share some of the results uh, we uh, identified uh, through the survey some of them i already touched upon uh, uh, the interpreters always found it difficult to express themselves also to understand people with hearing disabilities because there uh, they found it very hard to find proper terms for certain words Uh, for an example um, uh, there's a sign like this which basically means uh, you know it means sexual intercourse it also relates to uh, uh, co sexual partnerships or rape or violence so imagine you know you just rely on one particular sign to talk about different things and that basically can send different messages um, and our workshop uh, were always very interactive because we understood that it it, it we need to keep them very short we need to keep them more engaging so we use different pictorial and other methods to uh, engage people with hearing disabilities where uh, the, the consultation we did at the sri lanka central federation for the deaf and silon school for the deaf in terms of conducting the consultation um and and another thing we also uh, realized was that we had, through the workshops and the consultations we found uh, peer educators or people who were interested in terms of using the sign language glossary in terms of conducting a uh, further capacity building sessions and sensitization programs at the silon school for the deaf and in the broader community so the next slide will uh, also um talk about uh, some of the other results or or some of the actions we took after the glossary was published uh, the so we are working with several government institutions particularly uh, with uh, the the silon school for the deaf in rathmalana to use the glossary in in designing uh proper comprehensive sexual education programs for the students learning there uh and also we are trying to advocate and lobby for other uh, ministries like ministry of justice or ministry of education or ministry of health in general for them to use the sign language glossary in their service provision um Thank we uh, at the uh, sorry yes. have only two minutes if you can do wrap up thank you sure sure thank you um so uh, along with that we are also trying to advocate for uh the sri lankan government to make sure that the government would uh, recognize sign language as an official language because that would actually clear a lot of hurdles faced by people with hearing disabilities in general not specifically on srhr but in general uh, we are using uh, we have developed video modules and we have developed a website which contains information in a very uh, graphic pictorial way with sign language interpretation for people with hearing disabilities in general in sri lanka to access that information and and that content is also available in english as well and hopefully uh, you know uh, one of our objectives is to broaden 
that website and broaden uh, the use the sign language glossary we have developed uh, for for in other countries as well in other languages as well. Um, uh, if we move to the next slide, please. Uh, I'll sp briefly speak about the next steps, and I'm happy to take up more questions in the Q&A session. Uh, we can actually go to the, the other slide, which probably will be my last slide. Um, so uh, one thing uh, we discussed was that uh, uh, we uh, I we had conversations with colleagues from other countries, and uh, we were quite successful in building a partnership with colleagues in Rwanda. And and uh, they we shared our materials, we shared the process we uh, uh, did in Sri Lanka, and that was very helpful for them to successfully launch a sign language uh, glossary on SRHR in Rwanda, which they are currently using. Uh, with uh, their Minister of Health and Minister of Education to uh, improve the uh, quality service provision. We are also thinking in Sri Lanka to use the, the modules we developed for Sidon schools for the deaf in other deaf schools so that, that those schools can use that modules and provide more information for their students. Uh, one of the objectives of my uh, presentation today was also to uh, look at avenues to build partnership with other colleagues in Asia Pacific to also see how we can support your organizations to develop the glossary and see how we can improve services. Um, and uh, we also know that uh, we need to further update the signs in the glossary. So we are working with the Sri Lanka Central Federation uh, for the deaf to update the glossary. Uh, thank you so much once again for this opportunity and I'm happy to take up any questions uh, in the Q&A session and a discussion. Look forward for uh, the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lakshita. This is really informative and the wonderful work you have been doing. And especially creating this uh, toolkit, it's very important and the glossary because we know many of the countries have facing the similar problems. We are getting some of the questions, but definitely we'll go in the question and answer session and we'll ask you to respond further on that. Uh, thank you for sharing the short video because it shows like how the data is missing, how the information gap is so huge and these kind of practical initiatives can help them to understand especially the service providers police stations and different stakeholders so thank you very much for sharing this um now we will move uh, to siri chanda she is uh, talking about the this issue of sexual health outcome remain the challenge and unaddressed uh, un after a lower limb disability. And Sari Chanda, she is uh, the researcher scholar, International Institute for Population Sciences, Mumbai, India. Her quest for understanding the role of chronic nature of disease and their impact on human rights has led her to explore different aspects of population. Her work is focusing on disability, elderly, and health and social economic inequalities and qualitative research. Her thesis on lower limb amputation and coping, which is a primary exploratory study conducted in Kolkata and Mumbai in India. So we are really uh, looking forward to hear from Sri Chanda. Please uh, have the floor. Um, I will just request all the panelists to keep the time for 15 minutes and uh, we will make sure the other speakers can get the equal time. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning, everyone. And I'm very thankful for considering my work on this conference. I also thank my guide for uh, guiding me on this PhD research. And uh, uh, can I have my slides in the meantime? Yeah, is it all right? Yes, we can see it clearly. Yes. Yeah. So I'm also thankful to the resource center who has given me permission for the interview of the uh, person with lower limb amputation and uh, of course the respondent who voluntarily take part in this. So with that, I want to start my um, study and the title of the study mm -hmm. is that does the issue of sexual health outcome remain unaddressed among adults after a lower limb disability and answer through an exploratory study in, in India. So as we already going through the discussion that right of sexual 
uh, right of the sexual and reproductive health of the person with disability has already been reiterated in UNCRPD. In India, we have Act, Person with Disability Act, which, which came up in 2016, and we have sustainable development goals for inclusion of the person with disability in every aspect. But still, we find that there are hardly any large scale survey which are conducting on sexual reproductive health, and it includes the person with disability. So sexual as well as reproductive health goes beyond simple health rights because uh, disabled are also considered also known, I mean, it comes up in the literature that they are asexual, incapable of reproduction, unfit for sexual or marriage partner. So the issue pertains to that uh, is that they are being neglected to the sexual health rights. They don't have uh, much uh, choices. Awareness is pretty low among uh, society and among uh, legal or any other dimension they face barrier uh, to access they have very low resource allocation and of course stigma and discrimination in every sphere of their life so now the different demand for the sexual health across different type of disability already exists because a person with a lower limb amputation uh, hence the locomotor disability will feel some kind of a pain or some kind of a physical structural issue but the ment person with mental disability they have some different kind of a issue so one size fit all doesn't uh, doesn't uh, hold quite a good meaning in this case and for my research i have taken the lower limb amputation led locomotor disability the so the locomotor disability is one of the largest uh, share of disability in india in india we have 26.8 million persons who are disabled according to census 2011 and this uh, this is like 2.2 percent of India's population, and this locomotor disability consists um, contributes like 20 percent of the disability. Now, the one of the main uh, etiology of this locomotor disability is the low, limb amputation. So, I've considered had the lower limb amputation. Two main reasons which causes the lower limb amputation is that one is that uh, injury or road traffic accident, which is growing in India. Another is that uh, pathological reason like diabetes, peripheral vascular disease. As you already uh, know, and the literature coming up that India is becoming a diabetes capital. So it, uh, it is essential to know how this limb amputation and uh, reproduction of disability are hampering every sphere of life. And since uh, reproductive and sexual health, in my case, is sexual health is less talked um, area of research. So I have taken up this issue. Now, individual with low limb amputation undergoes several change. And since it is acquired, so sudden change is very complicated for them to adjust. Like they undergo physical change. The suddenly one part of the body is they found missing. And they have a lot of issue with the body when they found themselves ugly. And hence the sexual uh, representation of themselves is a, question, uh, is a question. Now the psychological part of it, like how they accept their uh, disability. So their self-esteem becomes very low. They undergo anxiety and depression. And several socioeconomic challenges they come across because they have restricted participation. Now the uh, to addressing of this uh, sexual health complication is meager while quality of the study, quality of life study is concerned. So they generally use the WHO quality of life study, uh, life study scale, but there the sexual and reproductive health right components is really missing. For this reason, I have uh, taken up yeah. uh, change in uh, the objective that what is the change in sexual health outcome after lower limb amputation and associative factors for it. So my uh, study, uh, the data and methodology I want to discuss now, the study has been conducted on the lower limb amputation. So those who undergone, undergone the lower, acquired lower limb amputation in last 10 years, the reference period was September 2018. So September 2008 to September 2018, this is the duration of time uh, when a person can a person has undergone a limb amputation. There has been take, uh, considered for the study. There are several inclusion criteria I have added. Like, uh, age group should be 18 and above and respondents should reply by their own. And currently the prosthetic, they should be a prosthetic user or prosthetic means the artificially amputation due to acquired reason only. For this uh, data collection, I have taken ethical clearance from my own institute. 
as well as the center from where I have collected data. Since the data is collected from Mumbai and Kolkata, several organizations and hospitals have been communicated for the permission and end up with the three um, hospital and non-governmental organization. And I have followed the time, um, uh, simple random sampling and I tried to follow the time allocation sampling for uh, making it a uh, probabilistic one. So for this study, uh, study is exploratory in nature. I have used mixed methodology. It means that I have used quantitative as well as qualitative data. For the whole study of my PhD, 274 was a patient like a uh, person with disability with amputation has been um, collected, informa information has been collected with the interview with the scheduled questionnaires and 20 quality uh, case studies has been done. But for the study, present study, I'm using only 196 respond data from the respondents. So the question, the outcome variable, the main question is that if you are married, do you feel sexual relationship with your partner has changed after lower limb amputation? The response has been given in good, normal, poor. The study variable here, we have used the age in categories, sex, male or female, level of amputation, below knee amputation, above knee amputation, reasons of amputation like uh, uh, road traffic accident injuries or pathological reason. Duration of amputation has been categorized in years. So level of participation restriction for that we have used the participation scale. And this, they, this have uh, 18 questions and this is a summative scale. So higher the scoring, it means they have higher participation restrictions. Now we also measure it in terms of how, which kind of, what is the extent of stigma they felt and what are the outcome of their sexual outcome. So for that, we have um, I have considered uh, five dimensions like alienation, discrimination, stereotyping, withdrawal, and um, inactive stigma. From uh, we have for, we had forty questions. From there, relevant components have been selected, looking into the reliability of the uh, data. For that, I have uh, calculated the Cronbach alpha, which came up uh, like zero point eight five. Later, another work status has been seen, work status is who is currently working and who are uh, not working. And last, the level of perceived social support for which I have used multi-dimensional scale of perceived so uh, social support. It has 12 questions, it is also a summative scale. And it asks questions on several dimensions that in which, with, which areas they are getting support. And the main questions are divided into from family they are getting support, from friends, from significant others. So higher the score, it means they are getting more support. Now coming to the result section uh, methodology. For this, I have used descriptive statistics, simple cross tabulation with a chi-square to check degree of association. And later we have, I have checked that peer bank uh, rank correlation. With that qualitative insights are also given uh, to support the quantitative data. And then uh, we use the state of picking software and Atlas DI. going to the result, I, you can see here that with the, the rate marks that they have poor sexual health outcome after their lower limb amputation. So if we're going across the ages, with increasing ages, see the red portion, this is increasing. They have higher difficulties. For female, they have higher difficulties. Uh, I couldn't run uh, the chi-square test here because of the data insufficiency. The level, if we see into level of amputation, we see that who has baloney amputation, they have higher problem. The reason for amputation, those who have pathological reason for amputation, like disease or any other thing, so they have higher level of uh, difficulties because they have to undergo the problem a longer time before they have undergone their uh, limb amputation. So duration of amputation here who have undergone amputation in last two to five years, they have much more difficulties in sexual, out, uh, sexual health outcome. The level of participation as well, who have extreme level of participation in society, they have a higher, um, higher percentage share of poor uh, sexual health outcome. Now the categories of stigma do out of 11 who have replied, they have felt some kind of stigma in eight to 11 category. So they have higher poor um, sexual health um, outcome and the, those who are not working and those have mild perceived social support because uh, they are getting very poor uh, social support from their surrounding right from family, right from uh, friends and significant others. So it, this keeps a complicated situation and they really felt um, very struggle 
to cope with the situation without any proper support. Now I have shown the correlation coefficient to check the association. As we can see, that low value that correlation coefficient with age, uh, with sex, with reason of amputation, uh, which means that the pathological those who undergo a disease, they have higher um, problem in this sexual health outcome. Re uh, level of participation restriction uh, categories of stigma has a positive and significant correlation. It means. Those who are exposed to this situation more and more, they are going to face all this um, uh, poor outcome in terms of sexual health. The work status and level of PARSIC social participation are negative correlation, which means that uh, the who are not currently working, they have higher poor health, uh, sexual health outcome. And the level of uh, PARSIC social support, who, which is low, then they have lower, uh, higher, uh, sexual health outcome and these values all are significant here now to supplement the quantitative part i have uh, cited some of the case studies here so first one is that one 41 year male uh, he had undergone a bologna amputation he replied on the question on sexual health outcome change after the after the amputation he replied that one cannot share every thoughts with one's own mother you also need support to friends to share certain issues popped up in your mind. I can share the thought of sexual desire with my friends even. Being disabled, it is difficult to share the thoughts of sexual need and get a suggestion from others. So there are uh, nobody in the family or in outside like any sex, uh, health worker who can support their uh, need or their queries, they can come up with uh, some solution. Next participant who are 32 year male and had a knee disarticulation amputation. When he was asked about the problem, he hurriedly replied to me, everything is all right, no problem, no problem at all, and just keep the topic. He was not willing to discuss anything more on this issue. So it gives me a, some kind of a thought that they are not very comfortable to discuss of this uh, sexual health issues because they haven't come over and they couldn't cope up with their amputation situation or disability situation. Uh, maybe that is the reason. Next is that a uh, 56 year male and transtubial amputee, he said that I don't feel a sexual drive at all. Whom I, uh, whom I would ask about this problem. We cannot afford a good treatment. I don't share my own feeling with anyone now. So here the, they are not uh, kind of afford, they don't have any affordable treatment for their physical health. Uh, how can they go for another treatment who they consider like it may cost him much um, higher expenditure. The last one is a 29 year fe uh, female. She is a bilateral transtubal amputee. When she was asked about the sexual health issues, she first replied at the time uh, her husband left her and she was, uh, she found herself pregnant. And she um, replied that when my husband left me, a lot of people have said bad words about me. Some said I have put this child in my abdomen from someone else. Uh, sorry to cut you. You have only one minute left. If you can kindly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. So when she went to the uh, next hospital, their people replied that you don't have legs. We cannot take a risk of delivering your baby. Although I don't feel huge trouble in the whole process of delivering the baby, but no, uh, but the word no or limbless is the only trouble I feel directly from every other person. So here comes the discussion and conclusion that every amputation and disability is unique in nature that needs to be addressed separately. Sexual health is an identity issue for the person with disabilities. Attention needs to be given to the older who are facing difficulty in socio-psychological co uh, coping. At first, the component of sexual as well as reproductive health needs to be focused and strengthened in rehabilitation processes. The inclusiveness of person with disability and uh, sexual and reproductive health component is need of the hour. And the healthcare provider must be adapted to deal with the person with disabilities and promote the quality of treatment. Last but not the least, sexual health demand is required to adequately address at this point of time if we want to include ourselves and position a good rank in sustainable development goals. This, uh, this are some limitations like we had a small sample and response bias because I interview as a female interviewer and the study focused on overall coping of uh, after lower limb amputation. So I couldn't go much deeper into the issues. I hope in the future I can go ahead with the much more uh, in-depth analysis. This is some references and thank you.
all for your patience. Thank you so much, Yeshanda, for your excellent presentation. I know it's not easy to provide the safe space to persons with disabilities to go in that depth and share their experiences. So thank you very much for that. And also uh, sharing and linking it with the policy level interventions. Uh, exactly. exactly. I'll be looking forward for the questions and discussions. We thank will you. take the question answers in the end of the yes. uh, all the panelists presentations yeah. thank you very much um thank now without the further ado we will just move to the next speaker who's going to talk about um uh, the experiences of young people with disability especially young people in the accessing the services in nepal so sibu shirashta is um, a senior program officer visible impact nepal and she is the senior program officer and is not uh, working for not for profit uh, women led organization visible impact aims to creating visible impact in the lives of every woman every girl and every youth um, by unleashing their social and economical potential. Her journey is um, in the sexual health and reproductive rights sector started as a peer educator in 2015, working to generate awareness um, in emergencies. After graduating with a degree in public health, Sibu has been engaged in advocacy work. So I would request Sibu to have the floor and present your work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present a paper from Nepal. Um, I'd like to share my screen. So just starting with a basic introduction, uh, I'm presenting on behalf of the organization I used to work for back in Nepal, um, Visible Impact. Visible Impact is a woman-led uh, not-for-profit organization that works with uh, young people and has been working in the area of sexual and reproductive health since 2015. Uh, this research uh, was conducted as part of a project uh, which uh, focused on um, advocating for uh, youth-friendly commitments in the Family Planning 2020 Commitments of Nepal. This was a preliminary research conducted to um, study the landscape and also uh, design and on the basis of which we would later design project activities as well as um, the implementation part of the project. So the research is entitled experiences of young people, specifically young people with disabilities in accessing family planning services in Nepal. So just a bit of a background in Nepal. Nepal is currently facing a demographic dividend in which 44% um, of the total population are below 20, are less than 20 years of age. 2.3 million of the total population um, is of the age group 15 to 19 years. By age 18, 40% of women have their sexual debut. The unmet need for family planning is high in Nepal. Only a quarter of, uh, only a quarter, 25% of 18 to nine years, women have their, um, have their demand for, uh, demand for family planning satisfied. The population of people, of persons with disabilities is 1.94% in Nepal. There is a huge misconception, there is a misconception that suggests that people with disabilities are either asexual or hypersexual. And it's often assumed that people with disabilities are not sexually active and hence do not need any family planning services. So there are not many studies conducted in Nepal in the arena, arena of sexual reproductive health and um, uh, people with disabilities. So a recent study by Marisol's International showed that 96.5% of young people with disabilities 
are not aware about family planning methods, while 94% have heard about abortion, while, but 39% are unaware of the legal status of abortion. People with disabilities are twice as likely to be on the receiving end of in inadequately skilled healthcare providers at improper facilities and are three times more likely to be denied of healthcare and four times more likely to be treated badly by healthcare systems. Around 80% of the respondents had, uh, studies have shown that around 80% of the respondents had one or more myth or misconception associated with family planning and abortion. Uh, literature also showed that only 28% ever consulted with service providers. In addition to this, um, the, respond, the research showed that service centers were not friendly to their kind of disability and lacked uh, lack of wheelchair accessibility, negative the service providers, negative attitude was present and also absence of sign language interpreter. So the objective of the study was to, experience, to explore the experiences and barriers of people with disabilities when accessing family planning related services and information. So as this was a pre uh, preliminary research, the scale of the study was uh, very small. So it, the design was qualitative study design and the study area were uh, Kathmandu in province one in Sunsari and in province and province five in Nepalganj. The study participants, there were 45 young people in the study and they represented various ethnic backgrounds and forms of disabilities. Data were collected through focus group discussions and in-depth interviews were also conducted. Uh, primarily the collect data collection tool was interview and uh, focus group discussion guidelines. So in terms of data management and analysis, the data was obtained through recordings, was obtained through recordings of the discussion along with notes from the note taker and non-verbal interactions of the participants were also noted. Thematic analysis was performed to identify the main themes from the data obtained. Now moving on to results. So I've sectioned the results in, on the basis of the thematic areas. So the first thematic area being the perception about family planning. The participants, majority of the participants were hesitant to share the behavior and perception regarding family planning. Uh, the male participants in province five were hesitant to even spell out the word family planning and they used indirect uh, terminologies to indicate that they were talking about family planning, like they used words like that thing or like that. And um, one of the participants also shared that when they try to uh, communicate uh, the family planning contraceptive messages to communities that they were working with, the communities would try, would shoo them away and they would tell them that, uh, they would tell them to mind their own business and that they would not, uh, that they would take care of the children themselves and any other person should not be showing concern for them. Uh, a male participant also shared that the word sex cannot be uh, pronounced out loud in the society. Respondents with prior participation in trainings or workshops related to sexual reproductive health were more open to the discussion on the topic. All of the informants also has shared that such issues were not openly discussed among people with disabilities. So the next thematic area is the methods used. Uh, so the participants had limited knowledge on the family planning methods used by other people. The male participants stated that the main method of family planning among the unmarried was uh, reliance on contraceptive pills or emergency contraceptive pills. So a female uh, participant respondent with blindness and command said that she would have to guess on type of family planning device being used um uh, among the women as she was not aware while another participant with physical disability shared that there are limitations on the kind of contraceptives that can be used by uh persons with physical disabilities since they cannot feel any pain below the spine therefore if dislocation or something happens uh with such externally placed devices then people with spinal cord injury might not be able to feel anything. So there are only a certain contraceptives that uh, 
that can be used for people with that people with physical disabilities can use. In terms of decision making on family planning, there was a mutual uh, statement that the decision on the usage of family planning should be made through discussion and consensus among the couples. However, one of the married female participants highlighted that usually the sole decision maker is male, but even under even when they are married, which is similar to what male participants reported in other study areas. Uh, a female in Nepal Ganj even uh, said that there is no discussion about uh, what kind of contraceptive to use, so there is no question of decision. But uh, the male usually offer to buy after pills the next day, and we have to agree with it as there are no alternatives with us. So, uh, and the females do not have the confidence or time to go buy contraceptives. So we willingly allow unprotected sex and the male, male slayer buy the after pill the next day. There is a lot of myth associated with contraceptives as well. Uh, example, condoms, use of condoms and IUD did not give sexual satisfaction. Vasectomy made a man uh, not so, um, vasectomy affected the sexual performance of a man and which led to mostly women using uh, contraceptives. Depo Provera injection were also most commonly used among women in the country. So access in terms of access to services, the attitude of the service providers was highlighted as a major hindrance for accessing the services. The participants shared that the attitude of the service providers would be judgmental and not very youth friendly when young people were seeking the services. So a female with a female in Kathmandu with physical uh, with blindness shared that it's difficult to identify which rooms to go. They have to go to the hospital with an assistant, and not not everyone can afford an assistant, can or can have an assistant. So the so these type of problems are even graver in rural health facilities. Um, and another person with disability share also shared that. Family, firstly, family planning topics are not discussed out in the open and is not considered a matter of concern for his persons with disability. So health, health, even the health uh, service providers say that, even, even the health pro service providers have judgmental attitudes. So when she tried to buy a vaginal tablet, the pharmacist looked at her in such a way like she was committing a murder or a sin. Since then, she has never gone out to buy a contraceptive device on her own. Also, the opening hours of the clinics are not suitable for young people, as shared by the female participants. The uh, gynecology clinic only opens twice a week, and it is often crowded with married with married females. So, when young people, so it is so going as a young person seeking the service among all married females, there are a lot of judgmental eyes looking at the young person. The time during which the clinic runs is also not uh, feasible since it collides with the time they have to go to school or college. So based on these, uh, based on the preliminary study and a few consultation and a few follow up consultations that we did as part of the implementation activity of the project, uh, we derive a few recommendations. We have developed a few recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one being that every that all the civil society organizations should work with people with disability centered approaches in all of their interventions. Existing uh, SRHR related act regulation policies have to be revisited considering SRHR needs and issues from accessibility perspectives of persons with disabilities. The government should make adjustments to its reporting te templates accommodating disability group alongside of a plan with defined targets to reach out to. This will help to gather concrete data on the needs and uh, the status and the livelihood of the people of people with disabilities as um, having data will help us develop more concrete programs as well. The existing health curriculum aimed at various levels of medical education should also include SRHR in connection with disability. So a lot, uh, so service provider by service provider negative attitude of service providers was identified as one of the major challenges in accessing services. So 
uh, sensitizing the uh, medical service providers will help to overcome these barriers. Uh, Sibu, you have uh, two minutes to complete. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So the, all the information services must be equipped with accessibility standards and these, for example, is not only limited to provision of ramps, larger bathrooms, but also lowered examination uh, tables, sign language interpreters, tactile communication provision, captioning, materials present in large prints. The research on SRHR of persons with disabilities needs to be promoted so that such research and disaggregated data on disability should be encouraged. So for further communication, please feel free to contact at the given email addresses. And thank you. Thank you so much, Abu. Thank you for your excellent presentation. I think this is really helpful because we also witness many of the time women with disabilities or persons with disabilities are the first one to get sexually harassed and face the discrimination, especially when we talk about uh, family planning and all. They have only one solution of uh, giving them the forced sterilization or mm -hmm. sometimes even not discuss with them. So thank you very much for this, uh, for sharing your thoughts on that. And we will. We are really looking forward to hear from the participants who are giving us the time, and they can ask the questions. You can write down in the chat box, or uh, once we finish the panel speaker, we will have the time to have one-to-one -one question answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Abia. <laughs> Thank you. Now we will move to the next speaker, uh, Ms. Anne Nguyen. Um, and she, uh, sorry, again, for the mispronunciation, uh, she is going to talk about accessing reproductive health care services for women with physical disabilities to, in uh, Vietnam. And she is currently doing her PhD at Monash University Australia campus. She has a physical disability due to polio prior to coming to Australia seven years ago. She has lived in Vietnam where she worked with and research on people with disabilities for more than 10 years. Uh, please, Ms. and uh, you have the floor to share your experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, I would like to share my screen. Okay, I'm good. Yeah, we can see it clearly. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Thank you. We cannot hear you, Han. Yeah, can you please unmute your mic? Anne, please unmute yourself. We cannot hear you. Uh, I would like to say thank you everyone today and sharing some of my uh, initial thoughts in Vietnam. Yeah, I think you I need to unmute the mic so we can hear you. Can you hear yeah. me now? Yes, now it's perfect. Okay. Please. Uh, okay, thank you. That's good. I'll share my screen again. <laughs> okay, is it clear? Yes, please continue. Yes, please. That's good. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me today and say hi to everyone from Australia. And I'm happy to be uh, here today and present some of my initial findings from my uh, PhD research that I conducted in Vietnam entitled uh, Essential Reproductive Healthcare of Women with Physical Disability in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. And here is some of my outline that won't be long. <laughs> um, as you know that essential reproductive uh, right for women with disability for uh, basic human rights and global public health. 
that's also mentioned in CRPT in the Article 5 that people with disability have the right to access to health without any discrimination. And also WHO mentioned in Sustainable Development Goal 3 that healthy life and promoting well-being for all at all ages. And reproductive health in Vietnam, uh, Vietnam is a progressive in terms of reproductive health. And most people can easily uh, access to contraception and reproductive health uh, are openly discussed in public and in the family. And uh, recently, several government policy actively promote the uh, reproductive health rights. Uh, the recent uh, statistic that I got that uh, the contraceptive use in Vietnam is very high. About 80% of married women have the age from 15 to 49 use some form of contraception. However, uh, these uh, seem uh, ignore the uh, people with disability. Uh, the division uh, in 2013 uh, identify that the need for a uh, reproductive health care strategy uh, addressing uh, health care needs for vulnerable groups. Um, however, the national standard guidelines on reproductive health care services currently don't have standard guidelines for people with disability. And um, people with disability uh, did not specifically discuss in any reproductive health policy initiative. Um, in Vietnam, we uh, not have uh, well uh, uh, the uh, statistic uh, on people with disability. So the latest number that I got in 2015 that people with disability in Vietnam uh, occupy about six, over six million people. And uh, about one in five households have one or more people with disability, most of them uh, live in rural areas and living with poverty and impacted by disability and they also have limited or no education. And the situation of Vietnam uh, uh, for people with disability in Vietnam is not hopeful as um, uh, the high rise of unemployment about 1.69 times more than uh, people with non-disabled. And uh, over the past decade, Vietnamese government has made the significant effort to improve the quality of life for people with disabilities. Uh, for example, they uh, had signed the CRPD in 2007 and ratified it in 2015 and uh, to seek to uh, recognize the rights of people with disability. And recently, they just issued the law of disability in 2010 and it's inactive in 2011. They uh, identified the rights of people with disability. However, in the document, there's no uh, mention about rights related to reproductive health. So my research is um, uh, explore the women with physical disability experience uh, of accessing to reproductive health care uh, in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. So uh, as you can see on the left side, that's the uh, map of Vietnam and the right uh, side is the map of Ho Chi Minh City down to the right side corner. So the data collection, I uh, uh, prior to uh, uh, my data collection, I take the trip to uh, uh, visiting some uh, healthcare services. They included the private healthcare services, international and also public healthcare services to see what's going on there. And uh, that, um, the second trip I make in June and July for in-depth interviews only. And uh, my participants include 20 women with physical disability, uh, five key informants and five healthcare providers. Uh, my research also analyzed, revealed some of uh, disability law, health insurance policy, family planning policy, including family planning health reports and some policy related to reproductive health. And um, some of my initial findings uh, from the participant, participant uh, share that they have um, mostly have positive uh, experiences. 
the infrastructure improvement, including the RAM, lead, and wheelchair at the healthcare service are available. Uh, for example, at PEC said, uh, generally it's very accessible. They have ramps for wheelchair, they have elevators at all, almost buildings. So patients can get access to any level. And another participant, Tan, they said that, also they have available manual wheelchairs there, I can borrow it. If I cannot use by myself, a volunteer there is willing to help and push me to the control day syndrome. So that's very good. As you can see here, the first picture that I took at the uh, district hospital, that's the ramp that um, has been made for wheelchair user. And the second picture here, I took at the uh, international hospital that the wheelchair uh, always available in front. So people, the patient can come and use it. And the last one is the elevator that uh, has made in the uh, international uh, hospital that's for public use. So uh, another positive uh, change is government healthcare costs for people with disability and culture them to reduce fee or even free uh, uh, services depending, depending on the assessment for their cap capability. Uh, at tools, um, a wheelchair user, she say, I got a government healthcare insurance I did not buy anything, it's free, 100% for me. So uh, the picture here is the uh, healthcare card. Another positive here, uh, experience was shared by participants that healthcare providers are more, more sensitive and knowledgeable about people with disability. At t Sea, the uh, access to Bình Thanh Hospital, that is a public one, uh, at Bình Thanh Hospital, where I register, they are very nice and friendly. Every time I go there, they always ask me if I need a wheelchair or a support. They also help me to register at the counter and absolutely I got a priority. And the doctor is so knowledgeable. He advised me clearly about my case as a pregnant woman with physical disability. So this factor appeared to support uh, people with disability to take good care of their health. However, some of the women with disabilities still uh, challenging with uh, terrors when accessing to healthcare services. Uh, the main um, barrier is the toilet. Some toilets in, some toilets in a public hospital were inaccessible for wheelchair users. Uh, for example, I uh, didn't uh, share that um, at the Yu hospital. Uh, some toilets are inaccessible for wheelchair users one time. My husband had to carry me to the toilet. Then he waited for me in the front of the toilet. Once I had done, I called him to come back and take me out. Then the people there scream at him, what, why do you go here? This is for female only. Then he has to explain that my wife is here. She cannot walk. So that is a problem that some wheelchair users that um, face at the uh, hospital. And another negative experience is the parking for for motorbike is far away from the main entry, or even not accept the three wheel motorbike. Uh, as new and then she has this problem, uh, you say that uh, the parking is a little bit far away the main entry. The entrance to the parking is so too narrow for the three wheel motorbike. So it's hard for her to get in. And another one uh, say that when I went to Chorai Hospital, they denied my three wheel motorbike. They said, my one occupied as mother to motorbike. So that's why they didn't accept her uh, motorbike. So this looks like ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> so um, uh, almost all women with physical disability had positive experience when assisting to healthcare services. Uh, this is likely that related to the government recently implemented disability law and would have brought about a number of changes related to healthcare, including allowances, reduced rates, and new infrastructure. However, not all people with disability are benefiting equally due to differences in the capacity of local government to operationalize the law. So women with physical disability access to reproductive healthcare could be further improved by improving the capacity and knowledgeability of 
the local law officer. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. And this is really great. And thanks on time. <laughs> we uh, know like for the accessibility challenges, that's the key where they can get the access and people are like not going out of their home just because of the infrastructure barriers, communication barriers. So this you have rightly mentioned and showed your examples. We are really happy uh, to have you in the panel and we'll definitely share some of your experiences with other countries. Uh, we uh, just move to the next speaker, um, a special intervention by a youth. That's the most important one. So we will just quickly move to Pyong Niu Wen and she is the Colorful Magazine Editor of Colorful Girls, Myanmar. And I would request you to share your thoughts with us. Thank you very much. Now you have the floor. Okay, here. Okay, thank you for inviting me and following, for allowing me to talk about this very important topic. So I will share some of my experience using thoughts about the interlinkage or our disability and sexuality and reproductive health and right in our region. So, so, so there's a 619 million of people with disability in each of cities. So in my country, Myanmar, uh, we have 2.3 3 million people with disabilities, which is 4.7% mm -hmm. of the total population as per the census of 2014. And so most of the country in the Asia Pacific region has focused on improving people with disability access to employment and education to minimize discrimination in these areas. So however, limited attention is given to the sexual, uh, uh, sexual and the health and rights of people with disability. Uh, several research findings suggest that people with disability have high and met needs in relation to sexual and the they have. So, this is mainly due to social uh, perception suggestion that people with disability, especially young women and girls, less sexual desire or agency, and therefore are unlikely to have sexual and reproductive health needs. So, in Myanmar, this view inhibits um, the ability of women and girls to meet their socialized gender roles as time bearing wives, and therefore that leads to the women facing diverse discrimination. So, as an issue in general, it's a taboo topic to talk uh, about in uh, about and in relation to as an issue, people with disabilities are rendered invisible. They are stigmatized and excluded from a sexuality uh, education programs due to lack of perceived need. When included in educational activities, people with disabilities often face barriers as um, material specific to their needs are and available. So they also find difficulty in assessing information from other sources like uh, book, uh, books, magazine, online and offline media. So, so networking, our cooperation and, and partnership between stakeholder inclusion government. So uh, government organization, internal non-government organization, local non-government organization and disability rights um, organization are weak. Some organizations are providing as an aid workshop that they struggle to integrate a disability lens within their programs. Uh -huh. So, because of the limited spaces and uh, information, people with disability can make informed and happy choices in their lives. Both marriage, domestic, and sexual violence, lack of power when negotiating for safer states, myths and Misinformation in relation to Asia Asia are rampant among women and girls with disabilities. Uh, they result in them having adverse as an age outcome, for example, unwanted pregnancy, abortion, sexually transmitted infection, and HIV. So among all, those who are the least educated, the least worthy, and the most severely impaired suffer the worst outcome concerning as an age and not only have the higher needs but the highest unmet needs. So they're, they're talking the issue or as an issue amongst people with disabilities. It's therefore uh, crucial that women are girls do not remain invisible in meeting their as an age needs. So how? Community should become more open to sexuality and 
disability and support their peer to achieve their SOH needs by integrating them in community uh, programs. So NGOs need to develop a disability lens within existing and future SOH programs by forging links between organizations currently working on SOH and those currently working with people with disability and people working on disability rights. So NGOs should work with people with disability from a young age to empower them to be able to challenge stigma and demand their rights. So they should also educate families, communities, and healthcare providers on disability issues to break down barriers that produce um, that produce oppressive environments. So the associations of people with disabilities should be recognized within existing policy and they have need as a social grouping given the same consideration as others. So finally, the voice and the opinions of people with disabilities should be prioritized and taken into account in the planning and implementation of policy, uh, programs, and activities. Thank you, thank you, giving me a great chance. Yeah, thank you so much, and anyway, and this is really good to hear from you, and especially engaging the young people yeah. from the grassroots and then in the planning yeah, really. and presentation side. Yeah. So thank you for actually mentioning them, and you are continuing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are now on the end of all the Flatway speakers, and we thank all the speakers for your contribution and rich discussions and your experiences, because this really brings the point where we can see the way forward, how we can use these examples as uh, a good practices in the region, and maybe other of the countries can also share. Thank you for uh, Shoba and Bobby for all your efforts to bringing the wonderful speakers today in the conference and we see like while we are moving to observe the international day of persons with disability we can also see there's a conference or conference on the state parties is upcoming in december we have the asia pacific regional mechanism of civil society organizations and un scap every year organize the asia pacific forum on sustainable development we can share these examples to these of the platforms we have the beijing 20 plus 5 review meetings upcoming so we can share that uh, also there and we will like commit ourselves to move together and see what how we can share all uh, the different organizations and thanks to the all the organizers thank you very much and especially the sign language interpreters so we are going um, to the uh, discussion on the question answer session so i will request uh, shobha here to moderate the session thank you very much uh, thank you abia and we now have the open session uh, we already have a lot many questions and we will try to take up as many as possible and participants can please keep on typing in your comments or questions in the chat box and those watching on Facebook can type it them in the comments box. Uh, we have a question for Abia from Bilal Ahmad Srinagar. And uh, Bilal wants to know, is the disability agenda high up enough for those working on different SDG targets and, uh, uh, and goals, like at ministerial, departmental, policy makers level? If not, how can we help push it higher? Because only 10 years are left to ensure that persons with disability are not left behind like others. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you very much, Bilal. Yes, we have this challenge in all the Asia Pacific countries, though we have the political will uh, to implement the sustainable development and the 2020 agenda, but still there are huge gap that exists. What we need to do is engaging and giving the platform to the disabled people organizations or individuals with disabilities. So they can have one-to-one -one dialogue with the policy makers. So if you organize the policy uh, dialogues with them and share your experiences, that can create a, a huge impact. 
we also seen like the financial allocations are not there the in line ministries who are responsible to implement the law they need to sit on the table along with persons with disabilities to have more detailed uh, discussions and interventions few of the countries have those good examples where they made their policies and acts according to the legislation and especially in line with the sustainable development goals but still those goals need to be implemented by the practical implementation and also there is a point for the monitoring and evaluation like who is accountable for that because this is not a legal binding document so the organizations have to take the leading role where they can see the monitoring and how we are checking on the agenda yeah. okay thank you uh, abia and others you have mentioned about legal barriers many other presenters also mentioned that now there's a question from beril uro a, a, a journalist and beril wants to know what are the current policy hurdles and legal barriers that prevent access to reproductive health services for persons with disability so would uh, our presenters like to yeah. respond to that abhi if you would like to respond and then others also i would request i think uh, since yes. i'm also low yes. student maybe i can just yes. Uh, yes, yes, give my thoughts and then hand over to uh, our other speakers yes. so yes. basically uh, the entire idea that disability is not understood as a subject and something that uh, something that does not give us any mind mindset about inclusion and how certain people are not like cornered in in the world they are part of the society i think the lack of information leads to lack of policies in our structure for example in in law if i study to begin with our courts are not accessible so if a person with disability has to go out there and seek justice there is a critical barrier right there but but i think that is like one area when i was studying law i wanted to understand what kind of law and policies are specifically for people with disabilities now we have very good policies in pakistan you know sometimes people who sit together to put it all together do make a lot of sense the problem lies with implementation so even if a policy is passed the attitudinal barriers and the people who have to take it forward are not ready for it they're not sensitized they don't have information and they aren't even convinced actually that this is something that needs to be highlighted so it all comes together about working on every level so the reason why the law and policy does not work for us is because it's not being implemented even if it is passed and uh even if conventions are ratified even if pakistan goes to the united nation and you know goes to these different forums and we commit to implementing them it does not trickle down to the grassroots level so pretty much i've stopped working on on the level of policy because i need to work on the grassroots level to receive those ideas and implement them i i, I hope okay. this answered your question okay yes yes so you're talking about implementation problems that the policy and law is there but not implemented would the other presenters like to share their uh, country example dakshita uh, how is it in uh, sri lanka yes uh, yeah thank you shobha and i i really agree with what tanchila was sharing there are a broad problems around implementing the current uh, you know policies and uh, legal provisions for people with disabilities but with with the work we have done at uh, youth advocacy network sri lanka particularly with people with hearing disabilities what we have also realized was that um there are issues in terms of the law itself uh, in terms of equally recognizing people with uh, disabilities uh you know in, in my presentation i also mentioned that we are lobbying the government to uh, recognize uh, the sign language as an official language because people with hearing disabilities you know largely rely on sign language as their main uh, method of communication and and it has not been recognized as an official language in the country it has not been recognized uh as an official language in the constitution itself although constitution to the sri lankan constitution provides uh provisions for uh languages in in terms of the majority sinhalese language and and the tamil language but it doesn't really talk about the uh, sign language so I, it's important for uh, for sign language in sri lanka to be recognized constitutionally because then um that will help people with hearing disabilities to file fundamental rights petition petitions and get get relief 
so that, that's one of the main uh, legal barriers we uh, sort of uh, at least uh, understand as uh, restricting the rights of people with hearing disabilities because uh, you know they, they have lack of access to information already and then if if there's a legal provision from the constitution constitution itself that would definitely help them get better quality uh, access to services and information okay and thank you dakshit and that must be the uh, case with many other countries as well not just sri lanka where recognizing the sign language as one of the national languages is concerned uh, ashibu what what is the status in nepal what about are there enough laws yes so the policies yeah, yeah. Are, are pretty supportive in terms of um, securing justice for people with disabilities and people with disabilities have been prioritized in the health policies, the Safe Motherhood Act as well. But as Tanzila said that the policies are there, but it comes down to the implementation. So the implementation is where I feel that we are lagging behind because um, and Mm, because like even I ha I personally have not seen many programs or health intervention programs being conducted to have sign language interpreters at all. So it's mostly in the big conferences that we have the sign language interpreters, but when we're working at the grassroots level with community and the community is diverse, we have I'm not considered, there's not much consideration to the nature of the community and the people with disabilities that are in the community and how can these information reach out to them. And in terms of sexual and reproductive health and rights, much of the uh, communication materials, especially the ones that you can read are not available in Braille, which makes it even more challenging for people with disabilities to access information. And even in health centers, sign language uh, interpreters are not present or the health service providers are not fully sensitized on how to communicate to people with disabilities or people with hearing disabilities. So um, I feel like the policies are there, but now the implementation needs to be uh, stronger to actually to complement the policies that we have. Okay. Okay. Uh, can, can I make yes. a can yes. I make a contribution from yes. from the Pacific? Yes, yes. I was going to ask you only just now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's it yeah, it's um well into the evening here in Fiji. Okay. Hmm. Uh, but to um uh, again uh, again uh, a wonderful session uh, an ex excellent topic very timely. Just a couple of comments. Um, uh, for the Asia Pacific region, uh, thanks to the UN agencies, the international uh, NGOs, to the uh, our, even our, our own governments, uh, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has, has set, uh, certainly you no know, uh, fast track, accelerate some of the work around uh, on uh, disability policy legislation. Uh, in, in, at least in the last ten years, uh, uh, there was a question around what's the remaining ten years of, of SDG. Um, for persons with disabilities, uh, we could say, uh, for me, uh, being around uh, uh, the work in the region for at least the last uh, three decades, whilst um, we could be probably uh, still um, uh, ask for more, uh, things have certainly improved uh, for persons with disabilities across the different countries in the region. Um, thanks to, of course, CRPD, thanks to also the ancient strategy, um, the various um, disability framework, uh, the ASEAN disability framework, uh, the, the framework for ASEAN re uh, sub-region uh, for the Pacific, the Pacific framework for the rights of persons with disabilities. And I think increasingly the, the, the voice of persons with disabilities to the representative organizations. So uh, governments have uh, ratified the CRPD, they've developed policies, some of them have enacted uh, leg legislations but the, the, what's lacking also in implementation is the resourcing, the resourcing of those policies, those legislation in terms of budgetary provisions in the national budgets. Um, I think that's one key issue uh, to see this policy legislation come to, to, to see the light of day and benefit persons with disabilities. And as for sexual and reproductive health rights uh, for us in the Pacific and also uh, for to uh, deaf uh, people, persons with hearing impairment, Sign language, we've um, uh, just be, be begun to, uh, I guess, uh, 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 start, initiate the conversation 
uh, wet appetite if you like uh, through also the support of uh, associations uh, of the deaf like in Fiji the Fiji Association of the Deaf helping us in the Pacific to uh, to share the word into the, uh, the, the 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 good work of sign language interpretation uh, and also the involvement of uh, organizations of deaf people um, I said earlier in my in my session uh, the, the partnership uh, that we have with um, UNFPA, for example, the work project we're currently doing with uh, uh, WAY, uh, Women Able, Able, Enable International, and also IPPF uh, and their members in country. This work is not ours alone as uh, person disabilities, whatever the topic may be. We, it, it is about partnership and how we frame the partnership, including our governments, including working with other uh, civil society groups so that the work becomes a shared work, a shared responsibility. Uh, I think that's just, that's all I want to comment. I'd like to make at uh, this uh, point in time. And again, thank uh, the organizers, thank the opportunity to, for, for, for the Pacific uh, to, to participate. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Can I? Yes. 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 I uh, agree with Tanzila Dakshita and Shivu that there are a lot of um, policies and provisions are there in our country after the problem comes when it's uh, time to implementation. I can share two experiences that disability certificate registration is very low in India, especially those who are in rural areas. They find it very difficult to go for uh, some clinic or where it is implemented and Sometimes even if they go, they come with the response that this is not the time, we'll do it later. So somehow they get, um, I mean, uh, they're not ac accessing the disability certificate and the provision, the pain, maybe disability pension and other uh, benefits they're not getting. Second thing is that when I interviewed the patient, when they come across the road traffic accidents and lost their limb at that spot, so after that, when I asked that, have you uh, put up some legal notice on the uh, vehicle that, uh, that caused you harm or could you catch up this thing? They said, this is not affordable for us to get a hire a lawyer because it's very costly and it will go long and long. We cannot afford all these things. So I really feel that there should be some pub public provision or lawyer for uh, public interest, for particularly for the disabled people who can um, uh, carry out their legal issues with a subsidy raise or maybe government should support them up. Oh, oh thank you. In fact, I was going to ask Ann for her comments because we got a very uh, best practice example from Vietnam uh, where probably the policies are in place and their implementation also. So I wanted Ann to comment, but uh, she has excused herself. She says her baby is crying. So she would love to answer the questions by email if there are any questions directed to her. Uh, so she, she is not available right now. Uh, and we have a question from Nazma from Iran. And Nazma says that women with disabilities face more violence in my experience uh, and a whole lot of range of violence. So are crisis centers or the support centers for women who face violence, are these centers equipped with necessary skills and tools to help those with disabilities? Would the panelists like to address this? Yeah, um, I just say one of the example, like we also face the same challenge in Pakistan where the crisis centers and the police is taken and the lawmakers, their offices were not accessible and even they are not um, like providing services on the sign language interpretations and all. So what we did, we did a research on um, the service providers and on the other hand, women with disability. So once we compile the research results and identified the gaps there, so in that uh, perspective, we established a peer support group of women with disability. And it was all virtual support during the COVID response because we thought like the psychosocial support is also needed and how we can make these crisis centers more inclusive. And we talked with the mainstream organization to conduct the trainings for the police stations, for the police 
stuff for the lawmakers and some of the people from the court. So at least they are aware how to report that, how to do that. And on the other hand, women with disabilities empowerment. So at least they can share that uh, challenges or the cases of the gender-based violence or harassment. And thirdly, we are creating a mobile application which will be providing all the services, the safe spaces where the safety spaces where women with disabilities can reach them. So it's not like designed by women with disability, but the mainstream organization have developed that, but we try to make it inclusive for women with disability. So this is just an example. Which can Thank you. Uh, uh, we have a similar question from Kaushal Kumar, who's a research scholar at Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. And Kaushal has a maybe a broader perspective question that what should be done to end uh, sexual and gender-based violence against women with disabilities, of course. The question is, oh, it, it should be against all women, but perhaps since women with disabilities are more uh, prone to it or they are subjected more to it. So, Setar uh, Eki, in your research, uh, this it involves about uh, uh, this, uh, preventing uh, sexual and gender-based violence. So, could you say something about this issue? What needs to be done more? or any of the other panelists, if they would like to reply to the question. Yes. Yes, Shibu. Hey. Yes. Um, yes. So I think like, firstly, a lot of sensitization needs to be done and uh, the reporting mechanisms need to be made more accessible and easier. But in terms of, um, uh, especially in terms of people with persons with intellectual disability, like autism cases, they need to be, they're not, most of the time they cannot distinguish if they're being, uh, being abused or not. So they need to be uh, slowly uh, familiarized with the concept of what is good touch, what is bad touch, how to, and who can they reach out to, who are the safe people within the network that they can actually talk about it to what if a person, like if a person is uh, touching them badly, then this is the person that they should talk about it to. And mm, these kind of things should be taught at an early age. And a lot of, for me, I feel that a lot of uh, the things should be incorporated early on through comprehensive sexuality education in the schools or to any centers or organizations that people with disabilities are part of. Uh, we have a question from A. Natakan uh, from Thailand, I think. And the question is for Seta Reki. Uh, a, thanks Seta Reki for a very important plenary uh, from the Pacific. And she wants to know that are persons with disabilities facing more problems with climate disasters, uh, which, which are so common in the Pacific uh, nations, especially women? And are disaster preparedness programs meeting the needs of persons with disability there? Um, well, thank you for the, uh, the, the, the questions. Um, and allow me to, uh, to respond to the question. Your voice is breaking. Uh, your voice is uh, breaking. What should today. be done to meet more violence against women with, with this, with this um, I think, uh, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, better now, yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Yes, yes uh, okay. Yes, uh, the, um, of course, climate uh, action, climate change, and also the RR, disaster risk reduction uh, management is, is, is uh, a big issue for us in the Pacific. Um, we certainly are involved uh, in that space uh, to bring forth in the, the, the voice uh, of persons with disabilities, including women and girls uh, with disabilities. Uh, there, there was a, did a, a research last year, a short research with the uh, funding from UNESCO uh, to see um, assess the loss and damage, particularly focusing on women and girls with uh, disabilities. Uh, in the effect of climate change uh, and, and, and livelihoods. 
yeah, it is certainly uh, women with disabilities are greatly affected uh, the, as a result of climate ch climate change and livelihoods. Um, for uh, for for disaster risk reduction, uh, the work that we've also done in this area, uh, our partners are increasingly uh, becoming to include uh, safety, uh, for example, in, in the evacuation centers. Uh, thanks to the humanitarian actors working in this space in this region, thanks also to the funding agencies uh, in this uh, in this region from uh, Australia and New Zealand, who are enforcing that funds utilized for, uh, provided by them in humanitarian actions uh, are, are covering, uh, including persons with disabilities, uh, inclusive of women and girls with disabilities. I specifically mentioned evacuation centers. Uh, they, they need to be accessible and they also need to be safe. Uh, you bring in WASH, you bring in SASR uh, aspects into the evacuation center, uh, therein we're addressing the needs of women and girls with disabilities in, in particular. So uh, we certainly are um, finding uh, willing and able partners uh, working in the sp these spaces, as I said, uh, this DRR, climate action, and, uh, and, and we, uh, the research we are doing now, um, in including also climate change, uh, several research is actually happening at the moment uh, on, on SHR, SRHR, climate change, DRR, uh, so please, um, uh, maybe next year, uh, stay tuned and, uh, and, and, and uh, visit our websites. Uh, we might be sharing some of the uh, results, uh, early results of this research and even some findings from our research that are already completed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sir Thank Dan. you, ma'am. Uh, we have a question from Amrita Gautam Nepal for Shibu. And Amrita says, Nepal has such a difficult terrain and how are young people with different kinds of disabilities, how are they able to get support when they are faced with violence? We are not even taught sign language in medical schooling, for example, uh, and in our OPDs or indoor patient services, they are rarely equipped with this. So what, what needs to be done for that? Shibu, would you like to say? The question really sums up all the challenges faced in Nepal and being so uh, geographically diverse, it is very hard for any, it is very hard for a physically able person to access services, but the, uh, but the challenge adds up for a person with disability. And I think that is one of the, rec one of the strong recommendations that, the dis that uh, organizations in Nepal are working towards to have sensitization for our health service providers on how to uh, how to cater to the specific needs of people with disabilities and the advocacy has been going on strong so hopefully, hopefully these, sensi these uh, uh, sensitization aspects will be part of the curriculum soon uh, but at the same time I think in terms of um, geographical aspect there is a lot of things that need to be done at the policy level and I'm not really sure of what can be done at the grassroots level Grassroots level though. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Thank you. And um, uh, we have a question from Abdul Akhtar Bangladesh for Dakshita. And Abdul says, is sign language gl glossary being adapted for different sign languages in different countries and regions? You had mentioned something about it, uh, Dakshita. Can you please elaborate a little bit? Yes, Dakshita, are you there? Okay, okay, we move on to the next question. Meanwhile, this is a question from Suraksha for Tanzila. And uh, Suraksha wants to know if the girly things faced any problems during the pandemic in reaching out to women with different disabilities. More so as relief or support was not sensitive for the needs of uh, people with disabilities. Thank you very much for your question. And it's a very good question. I like to say in terms of business, things expanded, things were better because everything shifted online and uh, we got discovered by a huge market. Mm -hmm. And the good thing was that we were already prepared for the pandemic, not knowingly, but our network was spread across Pakistan. We already had a good grip on delivery partners, what products are required. We also stocked some surgical masks and um, 
KN95 and hand sanitizers to make sure that women and families can get access to these products as well so i think in that way it was a great year for us and we've understood better channels the trouble lied with our existing delivery partners the load increasing on them which is why our deliveries got really delayed now sanitary napkins is something that you require immediately because if a woman is bleeding up there she needs the stuff immediately and our deliveries got delayed to like 2 weeks 3 weeks 1 month and that kind of amplified the problem because once we have got a client she is completely relying on us once she places the order we all do online shopping and we know how it is so i think that's where the problem started that women had cut off their other channels they were comfortable with our service and our service was not going ahead but we did receive a lot of orders we did get a lot of queries a lot of women wanted to know more about corona virus through our hotline so we also equipped ourselves with more knowledge because we didn't know we we all were in this together we had to understand there was a lot of corona shaming there was a lot of uh, uh, misinformation about corona about how it spreads and um, how you can catch it and what to do about it people would just lock themselves in in the room for no reason and even if they have like a slight cough and i think that's a very slippery slope uh you you can't do that and that again takes a toll on your health i mean imagine being locked up in a room and thinking am i going to die is my family safe from me i cannot touch my children or my husband so um then we would receive those calls so i think uh, girly things had to counter a lot of emotional issues that our users were facing and then that we had to immediately get more delivery partners on board and i was particularly happy to see small villages and small towns where our service had reached and women women are quite aware of what they want and i was happy to see that women in pakistan are aware of online services and they're ready to go for it so because of my small team also and yes one quick point i like to share that because the buildings were shut off and my team had gone back to their hometown all the inventory had to be brought down to my house and particularly in my bedroom so right now i i'm i'm sitting in a sea of sanitary napkins all around me it has not stopped because there's so much uncertainty about offices reopening or not so i've been working from my home so i think that kind of did over pressurized me also and i've been packaging myself so so yeah a lot of challenges but we're in this together yes you are right that this uh, the uh, pandemic has really strengthened us and uh, united us to face these new challenges i think that this is some of one of the upsides of it a lot many downsides though so <laughs> dakshita is back so dakshita there was a question from abdul akhtar bangladesh that is the sign language glossary adapted for different sign languages in different uh, countries uh, is it being done now uh, so the glossary was uh, adapted in uh, rwanda for their local language but uh, in sri lanka it's mostly done for the sinhalese language we are working with language experts from uh, the the tamil ethnic group who mostly frequently most of the tamils and the muslims in sri lanka rely on tamil for their communication so we are working with tamil language groups to design uh, signs in uh, tamil language as well so that's actually one of the larger questions in terms of adopting the sign language glossary uh, for other countries because uh, in most of the sign languages are globally uh, sort of uh influenced by the american and the british sign language but then there are a lot of colloquial uh influences into the language spoken in different countries Hi, so Hi, so yeah. we need to uh, sort of Hi, be familiar yeah. with the language uh languages spoken in different countries and then uh design the sign language uh glossaries if you are designing that uh in different countries and contexts Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, I think with this we come to the end of our session. We have already over overshot the time. But before we close, uh, can we have a short message from our chairperson Abia for the International Day of Persons with Disabilities? Short message for all of us, Abia. Yeah. Thank you so much. On this. international day of persons with disabilities we all definitely looking forward to have the main objective like where we can see the world and bringing back better 
like after the covid response how persons with disabilities are feeling what kind of challenges they are facing and also we are seeing the this year we are having the elections of the co committee on the rights of persons with disability so we really strongly support the presence of all kind of diverse disabilities there or your voices is very strong to uh, support that and we also looking forward like on the international day of persons with disabilities how we are taking the agenda of the sexual health and reproductive rights we have the side events during um, the conference of state parties on the international day so we can see the engagement of more voices from the region and on this international day we also commit like how we can see the positive change so at least persons with disability can live a dignified life and enjoy their rights and we join hands with everyone and leaving no one behind and also nothing about us without us so this is the uh, agenda for all of us thank you so much thank you thank you thank you abia and with this we come to the close of the 10th session of apcr shr 10 virtual my sincere thanks to the chairperson plenary speakers abstract presenters and all the participants for staying with us for so long because we really overshot the time today but it was it was because of you all you made the session so interesting that we just did not want to leave we, i still wouldn't want to leave but then we have the time limitations and special thanks to lucy and go for making this event far more successful and for reaching out to far too many people thank you very much i would also like to thank unfpa and ippf for their continuous support and help to apcr shr 10 virtual we will now meet on monday november 23 at 1 pm cambodia time for the 12th uh, virtual session of apcr shr 10 on the theme of hiv aids and sr srhr in asia pacific by till then i also wish all of you a very happy diwali the festival of lights which we are going to celebrate in india on 14th of november and which is celebrated in some other countries also under different names till and so stay safe stay healthy and stay happy bye bye